Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, welcome you at our fourth uh, seminar event of this uh, term. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, our co-organizers who helped make this event possible, and that is Dům umění města Brna, the House of Arts, for allowing us to hold this event here in this wonderful space and helping us setting up. And um, the Creativity, Rupture, Art and Architecture in Central Europe project team, uh, which uh, invited the main speaker today and made it possible for him to be here. Um, and this main speaker is Paul Sturton, um, whom I would like to uh, welcome here in Brno <laughs> and introduce to our audience. Um, Paul Sturton is an associate professor of the Bard Graduate Center in, for Studies in the Decorative Arts, Design and Culture in New York, and also the editor of West 86th, a journal of decorative arts, design history, and material culture. Um, his re research and publications focus mainly on two areas, and that's uh, architecture, and uh, then design in Britain and Central Europe, mainly Hungary, in the end, uh, end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Um, particularly graphic design, interiors, and print culture, but also public monuments, cultural transfer, and um, emigration. Um, among his publications, I would like to name a few. Um, a publication from 2005, written together with Juliet Kinchin, sorry, called uh, Is Mr. Ruskin Living Too Long? Um, selected writings of E.W. Godwin on Victorian architecture, design, and culture. But I have another publication here on um, the topic of our lecture today, Jan Ch uh, Chicholt and the New Typography, which I will... Um, distribute among, um, maybe should I start here? So you can, you can look at it during the lecture. Um, and then I chose an article which I thought would be of particular interest to uh, the students of art history. Um, the Vienna School in Hungary published in the Journal of Art of Historiography in 2013 I thought would be maybe interesting. Um, Professor Sturton has given public lectures in many institutions, for example, the University of Edinburgh, Cambridge or Yale, the Royal Academy of Arts in London, or the Academy of Fine Arts in Budapest. And I have noticed that one, um, uh, an interesting lecture he's giving at the Bard um, Graduate Center called uh, Gothic Visions from the Visigoths to, to Post-Punk which I thought was very interesting, and I'm sure uh, many students of our history would find that of <laughs> interest at, at our Masaryk University. Um, at this point, I would like to also introduce our other two guests today, um, Marta Silvestrova and Matej Vojtuš. Um, Marta Silvestrova is the manager of the graphic design collection at the Moravian Gallery, and also the curator of the Brno Biennial. Um, she is mainly interested in contemporary graphic and Czech graphics in the 20th century, and um, she has um, been in Japan in the 90s, and per per perhaps because of that she's interested in Japanese graphics. Uh, I know she published in uh, some Asian periodicals as well, so that could be interesting. And um, last but not least, Matej Vojtuš studies uh, at the Academy of Arts, Architecture and Design in Prague, uh, but he's also active uh, uh, in the Czech and Slovak design scene. In 2018, he was awarded the Slovak National Prize for Communication Design, if I'm uh, not mistaken. He collaborates with a number of other creative artists, and he, among his um, clients are, for example, the Slovak National Gallery, the Slovak Design Center, the Bratislava Book Festival, or uh, Aero films. Um, okay, I will not speak anymore, and <laughs> without any further ado, I would like to finally give word to Professor Sturton, who will speak about Jan Chichold and his new typography. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me quite clearly at the back? That's all quite good. And I also wanted to thank Marta and Matthew and a number of other people who enabled me to come here and give this lecture and go on to the conference in Kozice after this. I should begin by apologizing that, of course, I'm speaking to you in English because I have no Czech <laughs> to speak of. So I, I'm very grateful that you're prepared to sit there and listen to me talking about Central Europe in English. 
when you're probably as familiar with this material as certainly more so than, than most of my students back in New York. Anyway, what I plan to do today is to introduce you to a, a movement which has quite a, a precise um, date, uh, it has quite precise dates when it began and to some extent when it ended. But in my view, it is the central revolution in graphic design in the 20th century. And I hope to persuade you of that within the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And I also hope to introduce you to a number of designers whom you're probably not familiar with, but whom I believe are really important, indeed seminal figures in the development of modern graphic design. And some of these, some of the people we'll be looking at are, in a way, household names, but I think it's just as, it's very often because they were also artist designers. But there's a number of designers who began as artists but who gave it up because they believed that painting was, by the late 1920s, a pointless, elitist activity, and that it was graphic design that would be the barricades against which society would be changed. And this is a, a view that you often find in the correspondence of many of these people. There's a wonderful letter from Kurt Schwitters to Mahali Nagy, where he remarks that, Theo van Dersberg is a slimy dog. He has retreated back into painting that pointless activity. <laughs> and this is a, a characteristic of the mid to late 1920s that a, quite a number of people, not least El Lisitsky, Moholy Nagy and Schwitters, believed that it was graphic design where the new aesthetics would move into a mass society and indeed reach a mass audience in a way that the rather rarefied practice of oil painting or even sculpture was seen to be elite, rarefied, and really only addressing a tiny sector of the community. But that's something I'll come back to at various times. Now, I want to begin with a short piece by Mahali Nagy. Now, Laszlo Mahoy Nagy um, arrived at the Bauhaus sometime in March or April 1923. And within a month, he had produced what I reckon must have been the first piece of work that he did in Weimar. And this was to produce the catalogue for the exhibition that would be a real landmark in the Bauhaus. And this is it. You can see a Stadtliche Bauhaus in Weimar, 1919 to 1923. Now, many of you will probably know that this was a, a famous watershed in the early history of the Bauhaus because it marked both a culmination of these first four years, but also a change of direction. And many people attribute that change of direction not to Gropius and to many of the other figures who had been there since 1919, but to the young Hungarian, Mohoi Nudj, who had only just arrived. Now, Mohoi Nudj published, not only designed the journal, the, the catalogue, sorry, he wrote this short text, and this is the first time we come across this expression, die neue typographie which will become a watchword or a phrase throughout the 1920s and 30s. And as you can see, it's a very short text. But with this, Mohoi Nodj was making some very interesting statements about the future role of typography in changing the way that we communicate, the way that we understand concepts, and indeed how the role of typography will be to play in an almost, if not quite a political, certainly a cultural revolution. Now, it's not a 
particularly long text. That's the entire text on that page. And what Mohai Nudge was putting forward was basically a few simple points. At one stage he says, typography is an instrument of communication, so it must be as clear and effective as possible. The emphasis must be on absolute clarity. Well, everyone says that. Johann Gutenberg could have said that 500 years earlier, and it would uh, have meant much the same thing. But Mahinaj goes on to say, the essence and purpose of printing require the unrestricted use of all linear directions, not only horizontal articulation. All typefaces, font sizes, geometric shapes, colors, etc. And he goes on to say, given the elasticity, variability, and vitality within the contents of a sentence, we must create a new typographic language that is subject, first of all, to the inner laws of the expression. So he's wanting typography to be more like the way we speak, to have the emphases the drama, and the shift in tone and uh, vocabulary even that he characterizes as interaction between people conversing. Now, this breaks most of the rules that had prevailed in typography for 450 years. The idea that you can put some text, as you can see, down the margins in the borders, in different directions, that you can use multiple colors. He also wants different point sizes and sometimes different fonts. Now, he's not, this is actually a rather cool, restrained piece of typography. But, as you will see later, he wanted to liberate the full repertoire of materials in the printer's case to be used for expressive purposes. Now, you can get an indication of it from the title page down here, which was also used, incidentally, as the Bauhaus recruiting pamphlet in 1923. And you'll notice this is the beginnings of what, we will come to be, what will come to be known as asymmetrical typography. It is, to some extent, balanced, but you will see that the order of the various elements does not conform to a central axis. Indeed, Mahoynaj was very keen to move blocks of type and various bars and blocks and other colors and shapes around rather like a rectilinear constructivist composition. And he also, as you can see here, used different colors and different orientation. Now, Mahoynaj used quite a lot of space bars, those elements that had previously been used in the printer's case for spacing out the various lines or words or whatever, but he used them to print with. Hence, these solid blocks. Now, Mahoynaj designed the catalogue, but the cover was actually by his first pupil, Herbert Bayer. And Bayer was still an undergraduate, a, a student in the Bauhaus at this stage. And this was probably his first published work. Now, going on from this, Mahoynaj said he wanted typography to become more expressive, more agile, and as I've said, closer to the way we talk. But he then went on to make a number of other rather radical statements. Photography must become the principal medium of illustration. Photographs, small and large, take their place in the text where previously we employed individual concepts. And then he goes on to say that, indeed, this stage is that photography will lead ultimately to the replacement of a substantial part of literature with film. In other words, the new typography is a stopgap towards the complete modern form of communication which will be moving pictures. Now, what we've got to remember in all this is that Mahoynaj didn't know anything about typography. 
When he was writing all this, all he'd ever printed was his lino cuts. He'd never used type from the standard types, uh, type cases. And he had no real experience of printing on anything other than a very primitive hand press. That didn't stop him from thinking rather grand ideas about the role of typography, but it gives you some indication of the ways in which he could perhaps rather you, in a utopian sense, see the future of typography as something that would help to radically change society. Now, Mahoy Nudge was not by any means the first to look at this. In fact, Kutschwitters had been experimenting with many of these ideas since 1919, when he'd first produced his uh, publications. The first one was Anna Bloom, and then, uh, slightly later, um, he produced a series of uh, issues of this magazine called Mertz. I'm presuming that you maybe know a little bit about Schwitters, but I can explain that um, Schwitters never worked in any conventional media. He saw his work, whether it was collage or performance or constructions, he saw them as all part of a consistent um, aesthetic output. And to unify them, since he didn't want them nailed down into one medium, he called them merts, which the story goes that he found a scrap of paper which was tore, a torn sheet from a bank, which was Commerz Bank. And all it said was the second half of Commerz. So he, he chose then to call everything he did, whether it was poetry, performance, collage, painting, architecture, or even graphic design, he called it Mertz. So when he came to set up his own magazine in 1923, of course, he called it Mertz. It didn't mean anything. But as you can see, in these issues from 19, these ones are actually from 1924, they give you a very good indication of the way that these new ideas about typography as an expressive medium using a range of different elements from the printer's case. So that you can see he particularly liked uh, arrows, the pointing hands and such like that you can find all over the place. But by this stage, Kurt Schwitters was also experimenting with commercial graphics. And this is where art historians tend to get this wrong. They regard Schwitters' typography as something which he did to earn money so that he could carry on painting. But for about seven or eight years, Typography and graphic design was his principal activity, and I'll come back to that slightly later. And you can see one of his early designs up here, which was for Pelican ink, pencils, and, and graphic and drawing materials. Now, Schwitters himself drew attention to the fact that he was taking a lead from a number of other avant-garde artists, designers, and architects who had also seen typography as playing a central role in the communication of their aesthetics. And probably the first of those was the Dutch De Style group, who from 1917 had, of course, developed this very austere aesthetic of the three primary colours, red, blue and yellow, and the non-colours of black and white, and using only verticals and horizontals. I'm sure you, all, you can all picture a painting by Mondrian, and we've all got that hardwired into our consciousness. But what's quite interesting about the early phase of the style, at least by 1920, was that they saw that this aesthetic could be rolled out into all media, so it could be employed in architecture, in interiors, in furniture, and of course Theo van Doesburg, probably the leading propagandist for the group, also felt that their manifestos, statements and publications should also be printed in a manner that was reflective of the underlying ideas. So you can see from their early 
typographic or printed material, they're trying to develop a, a vocabulary of forms which conforms to their abstract platonic ideals of this rational, calm, orderly uh, aesthetics. So you can see that they're also beginning to use these elements from the printer's case to create abstract patterns within which text is disposed alongside the various elements. Now, slightly later, when they begin to produce uh, the magazine and, uh, and NB, this becomes much more sophisticated, and it's quite a good precursor for what uh, Jan Chickel will talk about later in this very clearly organized uh, page using red and black and using text as well as abstract elements in this strong rectilinear design. But the key figure in all this is El Lissitzky. Now, El Lissitzky had trained in Germany uh, as an architect before the First World War, and he came back in 1920 or 21, and he was resident in Germany for most of the 1920s. He went back at the end of 25, but kept coming back to Germany. So he was fixed there to begin with for five years when he met almost all of the leading figures, certainly in German, Dutch, and Central European avant-garde. And El Lissitzky's someone who was one of the leading propagandists, and also he led by example. Now, El Lissitzky had a moment of quite dramatic conversion to this re new repertoire of forms, because during the war and immediately after it, he was working for a number of uh, Jewish publishers in Poland and in uh, Russia, most of whom published in Yiddish. And he produced uh, illustrations and text for folk tales and for children's books. And this is an example of uh, that early work in 1919. He was based in this period at Vitebsk. Now, those of you who know much about this will also realize that in the middle years of 1919, Kazimir Malievich arrived in Vitebsk and ejected Chagall and took over, let's say, or became the dominant figure. And we know that El Lissitzky, from his uh, diaries and all the other reports of the period, said that more or less when he met Malievich, he felt that everything he'd done before that was pointless and he didn't want to have anything more to do with it. So in the same year that he was producing these rather fanciful children's uh, illustrated books, he completely transferred his allegiance to Malievich's suprematism with its emphasis on abstract form, primary colors rather floating in space. And we've got some of his earliest examples of this, probably the most famous of that early phase, produced within a couple of months of him meeting Malievich. This is the famous poster, Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge, where he communicates the essential ideas by the disposition of abstract form. Of course, like many of the other avant-garde figures at this stage, they didn't believe that this should remain the preserve of just a small coterie of intellectuals and artists. El Lissitzky wanted to communicate this to young children as well. So also in 1919, he designed his first suprematist children's book, which I'm sure many of you will know. This is the story of two squares. So rather than stories of animals and giants and fairies. This is the adventure of a red square and a black square. And they travel around the world. They get into all sorts of scrapes and mishaps. They leave the earth and go into space. Then they come back to earth and establish communism. And so everyone's sort of all set. 
So I'm never quite sure whether El Lusitsky really meant this for children, but <laughs> um, that's the underlying idea behind it. And it's certainly a, a demonstration of the way in which he saw the use of abstract elements in layout and expression during this time. So that when he came to Germany in uh, 1920, to 21, he was on. He, he was acting in an official capacity. He was funded by uh, Lunacharsky, the Minister for Education and Propaganda, and so El Lissitsky's role in Germany was to promote the revolution alongside the ideas. Uh, that were current amongst the avant-garde. At this stage, Lunacharsky was still a supporter of uh, the suprematists and proto-constructivists. And you can see what El Lissitsky produced uh, during this period. This is the short-lived magazine Vesch, or Object. It only ran to two issues, but it's a very uh, interesting journal. Or For the Voice, which I think was only produced in Germany, but it may have been produced in Soviet Russia. But this was, again, his attempt to develop a kind of typography and abstract form to uh, express the sound of the voice, because it's Mayakovsky's poems, which were, they were written down, but they were never intended to be merely read on the page, because it's called For the Voice. And like a lot of futurist poetry, it was quite violent. It involved the use of strange guttural sounds, yelling and shouting, as well as calm, nonsense elements. And this was the way in which El Lissitsky explored how he could print in a way that expressed the sound and the experience of listening. Of course, one of the first people that El Lissitsky met when he came to Germany was Kurt Schwitters, and he began collaborating with Schwitters on Mertz. And this was El Lissitsky's cover of Mertz. I think you can see almost immediately that El Lissitsky was a much better designer than most of the others. It's a, it's a, I think it's a really beautiful uh, cover, this. The, and also something that El Lissitsky, Chekhov, and several of the graphic designers were going to be looking at. They were very particular about the colors that they use. While m many people think of um, the new typography as simply using very bold primary colors, in fact, the good designers always seek out very subtle relationships between those colors. And that's not a great reproduction, but it gives you an indication of the way in which El Lissitsky uh, understood form, color, as well as content as the elements of this. Now, what you can see from this is that around 1922, 23, 24, there's a lot of people exploring the ways in which these new uh, avant-garde art ideas can be translated into print and commercial print, not artists' prints. And it's at this point that the young German printer designer Jan Chickold appears. Now, Chickold's slightly different from all the others. He was not an artist who was dabbling in print. He had come through the uh, a combination of a trade school and a Kunstgewerbeschule. In other words, he'd not been trained as an artist. He was trained as a printer, a calligrapher, a sign writer, and these much more practical activities. The career path that was laid out for someone with that training was, of course, someone in the print trade. But sometime around 1923-24, well, we know he went to the Bauhaus exhibition. We also know he was in touch with a calligrapher called Rudolf Koch, who was the greatest of the Gothic revival calligraphers. And he said later, to, he went twice to visit Koch, and he said, I knew on the second visit that that was not for me. And he went over to the other side and he committed himself to this, in, in a way, a kind of self-education in avant-garde art, and particularly constructivism. And he pestered 
the editor of the Book Printers Union to allow him to produce a special issue of the monthly journal. And this is what typographische Mitteilungen is, sort of typographical studies. And that's the issue produced by a 23-year-old who's just finished his apprenticeship. And you'll see what he's, he's called it a special issue, elementar typography, which actually means more like elemental typography. It's not elementary. It's not basic typography. It's, it's trying to get to the, the core issues. And you'll also see many of these elements we've seen already, asymmetrical organization, different directions of type, the use of different colors, and also abstract elements to break up the page and direct your eye towards different. So you get a hierarchy of information through pointers and advice. You also see the people that he's included. There are several famous names. Max Burkhardt, El Lissitzky, Ladislav Mohoynaj. But right down at the bottom, and you maybe can't see it so clearly, there's someone called Ivan Chekold. He changed his name to Ivan uh, because he was so entranced with the Russian avant-garde. He regretted that later, and that was possibly why he was put in prison in 1933. But we'll come back to that point. Uh, nevertheless, what Ella, this is a, a union journal distributed to 25,000 printers. And they're getting manifestos from the Italian futurists, the Russian constructivists, and a range of other people. And you can see it's full of um, statements, manifestos, and examples of this new type of uh, printing, which he sees as the future in mass communication. Now, like everyone else in this period, El Lissitzky comes up with a few rules. He has his 10 commandments, and I'm not going to give you all 10 of them. I'm just picking out a few that are relevant, where you can see what he's doing. The new typography is purposeful. In other words, it's not casual. You must know what you're doing. What's, what is the end result? What's the purpose of doing it? Since the purpose of typography is communication, the message must appear in its shortest, simplest, and most urgent form. In other words, you have to really reach out and grab the reader. The elemental means of typography, as he says, letters, numbers, signs, but he's very precise here. This includes the precise image, photography, and the elemental letter form is the sans serif. Now, he doesn't advocate it here, but the following year, in fact, he advocated that all typesetters' cases, they should throw the uppercase out so that type printers were not allowed to use the uppercase. It's a kind of socialistic view that some people theorized that, that the uppercase was like the aristocracy of letters, <laughs> so they had to be wiped out. Or as Franz Rohe wrote at a later stage, I don't speak in capital letters, so why do I have to write with them? So this is a very big point in German because all nouns are capitalized in German. So this was a real challenge to orthodoxy, which we might come back to later. He goes on to say that we can use all line directions and above all, and this was the only part which has actually got an, an emphasis in bold. This is the uh, elemental design excludes the use of any decoration. Now, that's not entirely true because he uses a lot of these abstract elements as decoration. But what he wanted rid of was the set patterns, the fleurons that typesetters and book designers used in this period. And... At the end, rather as a kind of Trotskyist statement, he's saying that, of course, we might bring about a revolution now, but typography will be in a process of constant revolution. There is never an end to it. So he says, it's never absolute or definitive. Typographic design must constantly change. Now, 
Now, soon after producing this, Chekhold was given a job as a lecturer in the national, or what became the National Book Printers College in Munich. There had been a great debate about where the national college would be, and most people thought it should go to Leipzig or possibly to Frankfurt. But Paul Renner, whom I'll come back to briefly later on, had been appointed head of the printing college in Munich, and he was able to negotiate for the, the national school to go to Munich, and he brought Chichold there. One of Chichold's first uh, commissions outside of his teaching was to produce film posters for Phoebus Palast, which was at that time the largest cinema in Central Europe. And I can't remember, it had a capacity of about three and a half thousand. It was a colossal cinema. And uh, Chickold writes about it, he was delighted to get this commission because he could put many of these theories into practice that would appear on the hoardings and streets of Munich. But the drawback was that he sometimes only had 24 hours notice because they didn't always know what film was coming up. So he used to prepare designs, then he would work all night at the printers and produce the poster which would then be circulated. And these are good examples, I think, of the ways in which these ideas can be translated into poster design. They are fairly simple and straightforward. This Napoleon's a famous film, but many of the films are, well, they've been lost from sight, but uh, I rather like the woman without a name on the right-hand side, which is rather an interesting attempt to translate the effect of a moving image and the beam of light from the projector and the sense of time passing through purely typographical and photographic elements. Now, this was the beginning or when he was doing this, this was not the beginning, sorry, this was well into one of the great aesthetic debates of the mid to late 1920s. Because what Chichold and many of his contemporaries believed in was that this was an art that was based on rational principles. It was orderly. It was, as we've heard, purposeful and communicative. And what they disliked was the prevailing taste for expressionism which had survived in Germany after the First World War and indeed by 1925 the great debate was somewhat between what we might regard as Neusachlichkeit, the new objectivity as opposed to uh, expressionism and expressionism was still particularly vital in the film industry which went right on to the late 1920s before it ran out of steam. Chichold loathed expressionism, as did Schwitters, as did most of the others. In fact, he wrote to um, uh, one of his friends in the Netherlands uh, in 1928 to say that he thought Metropolis was possibly the worst film ever made. And he was a film buff. <laughs> but he wasn't alone. Lukács, the Hungarian Marxist philosopher had already attacked expressionism, as did Brecht, as did Siegfried Krakauer, and ultimately Walter Benjamin. So Chickold was in good company, and you can see what's going on here, because this is two posters for the same film. Uh, Chickold's on the left, and Mihai Biro, the Hungarian expatriate who was working in Vienna. I'm never quite sure about this because every time I show it, my students are automatically drawn to the expressionist one. And the exercise here is to point out that, of course, these are two incompatible approaches to design, but they have a wealth of theory behind each of them. So it was quite a battle in between 1925 and 1930. But it was during this time that Chichold wrote what would become his principal work, where the earlier uh, typographische Mitteilung and the typographical studies had been a, a series of manifestos and rousing appeals to revolutionize design. 
The book De Neue Typographie, which came out in 1928, was a practical guidebook, how to go about this. In fact, its subtitle is A Manual for Printers. So it was very much about if you want to achieve this effect, do this. If you want to get this effect, you need this type of equipment. And so it was really was in communicating grand ideas, but with very practical information and advice. And as you can see, if you're placing illustrations in double columns, for example, uh, it's like a child's guide to the new typography. Big red cross through it is obviously saying, don't do that, do this. And it's full of these sorts of things. This was also published by the Union, by the way. And yet it quickly became, and it quickly became this breviary of the uh, new typography. Now, during this period, although he was, work, he was producing film posters, Chickles' real job was as a book designer, and that was what he was trained as. And it's the books that probably get, produce or indicate his finest grasp of these new ideas. This is one of a series of books which only ran to two, because it, it uh, didn't take off, on photography that he produced with a friend called Franz Rowe. And on the right, another book uh, on photography called Photo Auge. Um, you often see that picture of El Lissitzky, called the, often called the constructor, but rarely are you told that it was Jan Chichold who set it up. And it was sent by El Lissitzky to Chichold to illustrate or to be used on the cover of this book. El Lissitzky, Chichold, Schwitters, and Mahoy Nudge remained in close contact. And when all the men had died, their wives continued to correspond with one another, which I thought was rather interesting. So long after um, the heyday of this. Now, these ideas could not thrive if there had not, or could not have thrived, had there not also been a range of technological developments to support them. In 1925, the small Leica camera was launched at a print fair in Leipzig. And this opened up photography to people who didn't have to have a long training in chemistry and a range of other equipment. It also, interestingly, opened up pr professional photography to women. And we find that in this period, there's very few women typographers and graphic designers, partly because in Germany, like in Britain, the print trade was highly unionized and they tended to keep women out. But once uh, the Leica camera came on stream, women could take up photography. So we find a lot of the photographers, including Anna Biermann, Laszlo Mahoy Nadji's wife, uh, was a photographer. And most of the photographs that you know of the Bauhaus were taken by her. And we'll come back to a couple of others later. Alongside the new cameras, which could provide the kind of photographs suitable for the new typography, we've got a range of new typefaces, sans serif typefaces, of course. The most important of which was Futura, designed by Paul Renner in Frankfurt before he moved to Munich. And Futura was deliberately marketed for the new graphic designers. And you can see up here on the right, it's being advertised in a book that Futura is good for use in photomontage. He, there's another page which says it's good for asymmetrical typography. And you can see how this, these disparate ideas by 1925, 26, 27 are coming together. And these are the, el these are the essential elements of it. Asymmetry sans serif type, photographic illustration, and lowercase letter forms. Now, not everyone went with the lowercase letter forms, but you can see what some people could do with it. This is, a, I think, a really lovely poster for a dance festival in Essen by Max Burkhardt. And indeed, Burkhardt is an indication of how this movement had moved out into 
practicing design into the world of practicing designers the word grant the phrase or term graphic design was only coined in the mid 1920s and we can see how Burkhart's came to it Burkhart's had briefly been at the Bauhaus and he didn't like it uh, so he left the Bauhaus and took private classes with Theo van Doesburg and you can see something of that style aesthetic in this painting on the left hand side you can also see I think how easily that could be translated into asymmetrical layout where text and photography could operate in the same abstract relationship. Burkhardt's set up what was probably the first independent graphic design studio in Germany called Verbebau. And they produced a lot of, when he moved to Bochum and to Essen, and he was one of the first to commit himself to commercial design for various metal parts, manufacturers, builders, printers, and such like. And this gives you an idea of how the new typography was particularly well suited to advertising. The new photography with its emphasis on close-up, brilliant finish to each of the parts, even when it's machine parts or door furniture and this photomontage element could be juxtaposed as we've seen with sans serif type primary colors and indeed the uh, lower case now like many of these designers Burkhardt was not content to design he also wanted to theorize what he was doing so him and he and his colleague Johannes Canis began producing monthly verbiblats, which is advertising sheets, which provide theorization about why they are designing the way they do. So when you get a, when he was commissioned to produce a design, he also had to give you a lecture on why this design was superior to others. We can see the same with Walter Dexel. Dexel was a painter and art historian who almost by chance was put in charge of an art centre in Jena. And he'd already been experimenting with abstract posters. This, is, this one on the top left is just telling you to use gas in your cooking. But when he moved to the Kunstverein in Jena, he began, and this is, I think, really beautiful example of the way in which the new typography could be uh, applied using simple typographic elements. He began producing all the publicity himself. And by 1926, he set himself up as an independent graphic designer. And most of the work that he produced was in Magdeburg, where he had a contract with the city authorities. So he produced all the posters and publicity for the major events and exhibitions. This is the sport exhibition. This is a photography exhibition. Dexel is one of the most austere and what we might say is one of the most typographic of all the designers in this period. This is Billy Baumeister who had began as a painter. And I think that early poster on the left is a kind of clumsy translation of these abstract forms into a rather colossal letter forms. But the more that Baumeister worked as a designer, producing posters, books, flyers, advertisements, particularly these posters and the graphic identity for an exhibition called Die Wohnung. Die Wohnung was the exhibition on interiors, the home that went with the famous uh, Weisenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart in 1927. And you can see the posters that he produced for this, which again fall very firmly within this repertoire of new typography. Now, in Frankfurt, it was dominated by a brother and sister team, 
Hans and Greta Listikoff. Hans was the graphic designer, Greta, his sister, was the photographer. And they worked with Ernst May and the city authorities in Frankfurt to establish a strong identity for the movement known as Das Neue Frankfurt. So that not only was it a project to develop housing, the most famous example of which was the, Frank the Frankfurt kitchen, but more importantly, or not more equally importantly, they had concerts, they had a series of uh, workshops, they produced their own furniture, and they produced a monthly magazine so that you could be living in what was basically Frankfurt Corporation housing, and every month you got a magazine about avant-garde film in Russia or recent developments in theatre design, such like. And this is a very good example, again, of the new typography with asymmetry, sans-serif typefaces, and the use of photography. And the last of this group I'm going to mention is Johannes Maltzan, who I think is possibly, the, in my view, the finest designer of the group. He was working, again, to begin with, in Magdeburg, where he pioneered this uh, development of a, a strong modern identity for the city. And he also taught in the Magdeburg College of Art. And in 1929, he was appointed to design for a major Werkbund exhibition in Breslau, now Wroclaw in Poland. So he moved to Breslau and where he produced what is, I think, one of the best photo montage posters of the period. This was a, for an exhibition on home and workplace. It was about design. And rather like the others, Maltzan was never content to merely do design. He had to theorize what he was doing. So he produced his own headed note paper, which has three separate texts. So when you got a bill from him for his work, you also got a lesson in the new typography. It's very uh, dynamic, and it's all about how the new typography will change society. That already technology is moving so fast that the older mode of graphic design is now archaic, and we have to develop new methods to keep in up to speed with a changing urban society. Now, as I've mentioned already, the union is at the heart of this. It's quite rare to find a union advocating the most radical uh, aesthetic designs, albeit the politics. And at that stage, they had just built a new headquarters designed by Max Tout in Berlin. In fact, when Chekhold produced the typographische Mitteilungen, we reckon that the circulation was somewhere between 25 and 30,000. By, by, by 1929, the membership of the union was about 85,000. So this was a mass organization. Their publications had a huge distribution. And so when they built their new headquarters, they produced a book designed by Maltzan, which you can see here, to promote these new ideas in architecture, design, and the new technologies of printing. Now, not everyone supported the new typography. Indeed, some of the main design magazines were, um, if not opposed to it, they remained indifferent to that. But interestingly enough, the Deutsche Werkbund was an early supporter and their magazine, Deform, uh, very quickly took up the new typography. In 1922, on the left, as you can see there, uh, that was their first attempt at Deform, which really looks back to that tradition of fine penmanship and calligraphy that Koch represented. It didn't last long. The, the magazine folded after a year that time, well, with hyperinflation and the like. But it was relaunched in 1925 with a cover designed by Hust Schmidt. And then two years later, 
they had another competition which was decided in 1928 and that they appointed Walter Dexel to design the cover. So this was a, a, a what in Britain we would call a quango. It was, in other words, a quasi-autonomous non-government organisation, but it had government funding. It wasn't part of the government. It was there to support design. Now, I started with the Bauhaus. So, where is the Bauhaus in all this? Here we are in the centenary year of the founding of the Bauhaus. This is the pages on the printing department in that catalogue of 1923. And I don't know if many people have looked closely at it, but the printing equipment is absolutely pathetic. <laughs> They have three hand presses, and from contemporary reports, one of them never worked. <laughs> so they have an etching press at the back, they have a lithographic press, and they've got this platen press in the foreground, which is an adaptation of an American press produced in Germany, which printers didn't use for printing, but only for proofing. They didn't think it was good enough for printing. Now, there's a, there are many reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. Just to say that no wonder they didn't teach graphic design at the Bauhaus in Weimar because they didn't have the equipment to do it. And that's why, indeed, all the early publications are very firmly in a kind of artist's print mode. In other words, limited edition prints. Partly because, well, as you may remember from the manifesto in 1919, it, it's, the main image is, of course, a woodcut of a Gothic cathedral designed by uh, Feininger. But the reason for that was that they didn't have presses. They had no type, which had been taken away during the First World War. But what they did have, by accident, was a large collection of very good high quality handmade paper. So what do you do with that? You produce artists' prints. <laughs> and that's what the Bauhaus did for the first six years. Of, that's what the printing department did. And there are five sets of these folios of prints. And when Mahoy Nudge arrived in 1923, he wanted to teach graphic design or wanted it taught. He couldn't teach it. but there was no uh, facilities. So what they did instead was introduce the new typography in the graphic identity of the Bauhaus, although it was not taught within the college. So the first thing you can do that's very easy, you change the headed note paper. So this is Mahoy Nudge's headed note paper on the left, and these two are uh, designed by uh, his student, Herbert Bayer. That was very easy. Any, anyone can get their headed note paper done. It wasn't produced in the college. It was sent out to a printing department. And the nearest thing to the introduction of the new typography into the, what might be regarded as the mainstream of the Bauhaus was not in the teaching, but in their publications. And of course, these weren't Draw, they were designed on, in the Bauhaus by Maholi Nash, but sent out to a publisher and printer where they were produced separately. And this is the great Bauhaus book series that was only launched in 1925 and ran right up to 1930. Indeed, it was in this that Mahoy Nudge really ex filled out many of the ideas that he'd sketched in that essay in 1923, and particularly in his own book, Malerai Photographie Film, which appeared in 1925. And this is, quite apart from the content, probably the best expression of his ideas about asymmetrical typography. Most graphic designers I've spoken to said, well, it's all very well, but it's not that good. <laughs> Because, as I've said, he was not working as a, as a committed graphic designer. He was drawing these out and handing them over to printers to produce. And those marks out a slight distinction between someone like Mahali Naj and Jan Chichold. And indeed, 
when they moved to Dessau, we don't really know what equipment they had. It's quite difficult to find out. But more importantly, they did have a new printing department in the basement. I've not been able to work out what it was. But by this stage, my nudge had got fed up with graphics. And he was into light, photography, and a range of other forms. The main Bauhaus designer of this period was Herbert Bayer. And indeed, Herbert Bayer was allowed to introduce a course on what they called advertising design, verbe, or uh, reclam, in 1927. But Herbert Bayer left before the end of that academic year, uh, so the course never really got started. And in, Herbert Bayer himself only worked within the Bauhaus, producing posters for Bauhaus events, such as the Kandinsky on the bottom left, or Bauhaus-related activities, advertisements for Marcel Breuer's tubular furniture, the Bauhaus catalogue. He did design a sans-serif face, but it was never a typeface. It's more properly called an alphabet. It was never cut. It couldn't be cut at that time. You can get it digitally now, but it was never produced in metal. And in fact, his best work was probably for the Bauhaus magazine. Now, to end, I want to just draw your attention to a rival group. And this was a group of emerging designers who felt that the disparate nature of the new typography needed some coordinating central body. And this was the Ring Neue Werbegestalter, the Ring of New Advertising Designers. And it was launched by Kurt Schwitters. So far from printing and graphic design being a hobby on the side, this was his primary activity. Schwitter set it up. He began corresponding with all the various members, or at least his wife did, and he set up this network so that people all over Northern and Central Europe were made aware of one another's work. And at its height, there was about, I'm never quite sure if there was 31 or 32 members, but we've got an idea uh, thereabouts. And this was their headed note paper designed by um, Schwitters. And on the right-hand side is Jan Chickles' headed note paper because he was one of the first members of the ring. And you can see when he changed his name at the top right, it's Jan Chickold Ring NWG, Neue Werbegestalter. So he was totally committed to this new network. Now, it wasn't anything more than a, a group of like-minded designers who wanted to find a way of promoting their work. So what they did was organized exhibitions, which they sent touring around Europe. And that was so popular that they had to create a second exhibition so that at one stage they had two exhibitions touring around Germany, the Netherlands, and other parts of Central Europe. They also had foreign corresponding members, El Lissitzky. But the two centers that were most closely associated with the ring were the Dutch, where there were three members, above all, Piet Zwart, who has a good claim to being the uh, most ambitious designer in, during this period. This that you can see is, these are all designs for a cable manufacturer rendered into this very dramatic uh, form of promotion. Now this is to interest people who will be buying metal cables and yet it is presented in this manner that's one of the most radical forms. The other great center was the relatively new state of Czechoslovakia. And indeed, from the very early stages around 1925, Jan Chichold was in touch, above all, with Karol Tiger. 
Now, Tiger, the, many of the, almost everything I'm showing you today is drawn from Jan Chickold's own collection because Chickold, alongside the ring, began writing to people and assembling a sort of museum of contemporary graphic design. And there's a lot of work by uh, Tiger in this. Above all, the um, Nesval, there are no copies of Devitzil, uh, but there are several copies of Red. And also I was able to include this um, book of poems in the exhibition that I organised, which you can see illustrated in red, and these are examples of the various pages. But Tiger participated in the ring exhibitions, but he was never a close member. Instead, they found a much more receptive figure in Ladislav Sutnar, who was already doing what the Germans and the Dutch were interested in, above all in his work for um, Trustevni Prachi. But even before that, in a series of posters, flyers, to a lesser extent books, but above all, perhaps, in that great series of magazine and book covers that he produced between about 1928 and the early to mid-1930s. These conform to all the principles that Jan Chichold, Kurt Schwitters and El Lissitzky were advocating. And indeed, Sutnar remained a close correspondent of Chichold uh, throughout the 30s and indeed after Sutnar um, didn't so much emigrate as was um, isolated in New York and chose to rebuild his career there. I'm not going to go into these in any great detail. Another figure that was also a correspondent of Chekhold in this period was Zdenek Rossmann, who's not nearly as well known, but since many of the new typographers were particularly keen to evangelize, I suspect that Rossmann was particularly interesting to Chichold because he provided a lot of teaching aids about how to uh, communicate, or how basically to teach students in the principles of letter construction, typography, and other elements in that. Now, this is where these two groupings, the Bauhaus and the new, and the new typographers, or the ring, come into conflict because the ring which was very keen to um, promote their work, approached the Bauhaus. Kurt Schwitters wrote to Gropius, uh, who pa probably passed it on to Herbert Bayer, I'm not quite sure, to say that we would like to collaborate with the Bauhaus to promote modern graphic design. And they got an incredibly high-handed reply, which you can see up here. Said, well, basically, we don't disagree with you, but we'll only do it on our terms. So this is a college which isn't teaching graphic design very well. It's telling 30 people who have not only developed practices in contemporary graphic design, have also engaged in quite elaborate theorization of what they were doing. And they're being told by the Bauhaus that, well, we can only do it on our terms. Well, rather cheekily, Kurt Schwitters copied this reply from Herbert Bayer or Gropius and sent it to all the members. And the ring members then wrote back and their comments survive, <laughs> but we don't know who wrote what. <laughs> but they basically said the Bauhaus is a rather privileged institution that is not part of our movement. And indeed, it's quite interesting to see that the Bauhaus, which is particularly in the US, since Herbert Bayer, Walter Gropius and Mahoy Nudge all went there, the Americans all think the Bauhaus was this fledgling, beautiful little thing that was treated terribly by the Weimar authorities. Well, the ring don't see it that way. <laughs> they see the Bauhaus as an institution that was quite privileged and which did not engage with the principles of modern graphic design. 
And indeed, Bayer soon left the Bauhaus, set up in private practice in Berlin, and he was replaced by, or Hust Schmidt, who was primarily teaching in the sculpture and metalwork department. And we don't really know a great deal of what courses were on offer in these last few years of the, after 1928, 29, thereabouts. But it's quite clear that the Bauhaus's curriculum was not nearly as radical or innovative as that in the Stadelschule in Frankfurt, the school in Magdeburg, in Breslau, in Munich, and in Leipzig. And this was brought to the fore in the fact that in these last few years of the 1920s, there was a series of major exhibitions in which the Bauhaus hardly figured. Pressa in Cologne, which was dominated by El Lissitzky's work, as well as all the great German publishers. This was, El Lissitzky prepared the Russian pavilion with little more than cardboard, glue, and a pair of scissors. And he put the whole exhibition together from just the material that to hand. But this was a massive exhibition. And the following year, in film and photo in Stuttgart, in 1929, several members of the ring uh, had special rooms. But the only figure from the Bauhaus, and he'd left by this stage, was Maholi Naj, and he played a, a, an active role. No other Bauhaus designers played any role in it. And this was brought into sharp relief when in 1930, a pair of brothers, Heinz and Bodo Rasch, produced an exhibition and book called Gefeselter Blick, The Captured Glance, which was a survey of modern avant-garde graphic design in Germany and Switzerland. In fact, there were 26 people chosen and the only person linked to the Bauhaus was Maholi Naj, who had left two years earlier. No other Bauhaus figures. Instead, what we find is that Herbert Bayer began to develop a very different style moving away from the new typography, becoming much more interested in surrealism and vivid color palettes that were quite alien to the new typographers. Now, in March 1933, when Hitler came to power, Chekhold was put in prison, and every other person I have mentioned today, today lost their jobs within a month of the uh, um, Nazi takeover. With one exception, Herbert Bayer continued working for the Nazis throughout the 30s till 1938 when he left to move to America. So this tells us two or three things. The, the new typography was still associated with Kultur Bolshevismus on the one hand, but also it tells us that the Nazis were not averse to modern art when it served their purposes, but surrealism was the preferred modern movement of the Nazis. Constructivism was unacceptable, and the new typography ended in Germany in 1933, but was brought back after the war in a form that we would now probably describe as Swiss style but it lost its political dimension and it lost a lot of its theorization or its utopian theorization. But nevertheless, in that 10 years or so, I think we've witnessed a revolution in graphic design and that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I would like to ask our guests to come up and join us here. We'll take a, a minute to set up.
Okay, so um, I would like to thank for the great lecture. And now, I, firstly, I'd like to ask uh, the audience if they have any questions. I will give a couple seconds to the person who will be first to um, gain the courage to, yes, great. Okay, I will, please speak in. Um, Paul, can I just, I'm really curious, that rather naughty statement towards the end, that surrealism was the Nazis' preferred idiom. I quite like, because, uh, I mean, obviously you're right, aren't you, the fact that uh, there was quite a lot of debate, wasn't there, about, for example, whether they would accept expressionism or not as an authentically German. Um, and I wonder, that comment about surrealism, is that, um, was that just being a little bit provocative or is it based on a little bit more uh, in a research looking at the kinds of imagery that, that gets censored and those that, uh, you know, are accepted and the kinds of figures who are allowed to carry on practicing. So I think it would be interesting. Well, to you're, you're quite right. That a lot of it was just being cheeky. <laughs> but, oh, uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. But, um, there is an, uh, more than a kernel of truth in that. It's not on. This, one, this one's on. All oh, right. Uh, in that, um, and it's not just Herbert Bayer. One of the interesting features of the collaborators in France, many of them came from the surrealist circle. Um, their names have escaped me at the moment, but there are a number. Uh, but in Germany, um, surrealism th uh, thrived in the popular advertising. And this, when I say it thrived, it, it was hardly everywhere, but it was still allowed. Whereas everything else that was tainted with Bolshevism was stamped out. And this did involve um, tacit approval, because one of the first things that happened after March 1933 was the creation of um, Goebbels' Ministry of Information and Education. And that had seven departments um, within it. So press advertising and press copy were, were two separate departments, and therefore uh, the fact that Herbert Bayer and a number of others were able to work quite successfully. And in fact, Herbert Bayer wasn't just producing advertisements. He was, he was working for state um, agencies in these exhibitions. Um, there's one, in fact, called the Deutsche Folk from 1936, which is, I think he dropped that from his CV later. <laughs> But it does indicate that um, while there's not, a gr I've not read anything explicitly on it, the fact that that stuff s survived and appeared officially meant it was approved by that um, by the ministry, by Goebbels' de various departments in that. But it's a, you're right. I was being, sl I was over egging it there. <laughs> Thank you. I've got two questions. Uh, one is about reception. And, um, and you mentioned at some point uh, the unions and, um, uh, and that uh, new typography was used in these uh, magazines that were widely distributed in some sort of housing estates. What, is it possible to say how, uh, what, how people responded to these um, um, magazines because I guess they were very, very different from what they were used to. And the other question is more sort of practical, methodological one. Um, so given that you're looking at these transnational people, graphic designers, so how, how do you research people like that who moved around Europe, the, they went to the States? Uh, so I think that might be also for the students quite interesting to mm. hear, um, how do you go about research like that? Thank you. Well, I'll, um, I'll 
take the second one first, if I may, the, um, the practical aspects. It's actually been quite difficult to follow up many of these individual designers because, as I've indicated there, uh, the new typography or this generation of graphic designers were dispersed throughout Germany, Czechoslovakia. There were examples in uh, Hungary and Poland, but above all, also in the Netherlands. But the the whole the the identity of a or the identification of a of a role or a job that we would call graphic design or a graphic designer had not really been formulated. So there is there are very there are no official organisations other than the union, and the union was in principle not a design organisation; it was a, a trades union. So what I've found is that also I should say that with um, more than a decade, well, 12 years of Nazism, all of these people lost their jobs if they were teaching and if they were in private practice or as, a, as designers, they got no work. They weren't allowed to, to design. So it's very difficult to follow up. It's only, well, I should say, plus museums did not collect that material. So you tend to find it in regional collections. Uh, so in the towns where the designers were based, because a lot of them did work for civic authorities. Kurt Schwitters was the designer for Hanover City Council, just as uh, Dexel was in Magdeburg, Maltzan was in Breslau and places like that. And the only places, uh, the only way that I've been able to follow up individually. Well, it was, I began because Chickold assembled all this material to bring it together. But I'm trying to follow it up through the colleges in each of the cities, because many of them, as I've said, had a kind of evangelizing spirit, that it wasn't just designing, they wanted to teach and to um, promote these ideas. So. The Stadelschule in uh, Frankfurt, the college, the Kunstgewerbeschule in Magdeburg, and I, think, I can't remember the name of the school in, in Breslau. These were outposts where the colleges developed, well, partly because Germany had a um, very dispersed educational system which was still largely dominated by the earlier regions or the states, so their own colleges. So each of these colleges tended to run their own curriculum. So that's one place that I've found it. But the only other one is um, if the families of the designers and they, they sold some of their collections because they were they began dying off in the 1970s <laughs> and so uh, you find that some of them were purchased by certain city authorities but you cannot go to a single place for this but sorry to give you such a long-winded answer <laughs> it, it is quite difficult but it, i found it easier to follow the individual rather than the movement. I came to it as a, as a collective movement, but to do detailed research, you might be better following up individual designers. To go back to your earlier question, how, how was it received? Um, I think in some, in some areas it was quite well received, but I don't think that was because of the market. It was taken up by the printer's union, but the members of the union didn't choose to buy typographische Mitteilungen. I think that was a rather paternalistic view that the, the union officers decided that this was a radical new style with a political uh, dimension that they wanted to promote. And the same goes for Das Neue Frankfurt, that was sold, but so cheaply to people in Frankfurt that you couldn't say it thrived on the open market. And likewise, deform was for members of the Deutsche Werkbund.
So it had wide circulation and it did have a real impact on advertising, but I don't think it was quite as successful as some of the other more sensational illustrated magazines, for example. Germany was the great center for illustrated magazines in before and after the First World War. So I think the largest circulation magazine in the world at that time was the Berliner Illustrierte Zeitung, which was a weekly with a circulation of over two million. Uh, but so it never the new typography never got into that level. But I do think it it um, it definitely moved out from being a the preserve of little magazines that were the sort of activities of the avant-garde. Again, it's, it's difficult to say. Hmm. I hope that's answered part of it anyway. Um, okay, I, I will give a um, couple more questions to the audience before I ask one. <laughs> Anybody wants to go first? Can't see everybody. Um, and, uh, okay. um, a follow up question would be then um, from the perspective of the present, um, what is striking is that for all that it has these utopian ideals, and you know what I'm going to say, don't you, which yeah, is to say. <laughs> it ends up becoming a style and it ends up becoming commodified. And, um, the, uh, uh, and yes, and of course, when we see Swiss design from the 50s and 60s, where it's become the language of corporations, hasn't it? It's the visual, it's the vi visual language of a, a very sophisticated, you know, visually sophisticated corporations, but it's already there in the twenties. And, and yes, I was interested, you know, when you showed the um, uh, the, the Czechoslovak examples, you know, when you have a Sutnar and uh, you know Panorama and all of those, which are all all about mar ultimately marketing products, aren't they? Um, so, was there any? Um, was there any conversation or discussion about that at the time? Did anybody sort of realize that almost they were, you know, running this danger of just producing what looks like a, an aestheticized, you know, that it was losing perhaps its cutting edge? The, yes, the, there was, although the, the terms of the debate were not exactly as you'd framed yeah. it. Um, the, the real debate, if I can put it that way, was about the role of advertising in that um, many, even in Mahoy Nadji's initial statements and in each of the statements by Kurt Schwitters and by Chichel, what they are advocating when they talk about the message must be urgent, clear, dynamic, of course, that's not suitable for um, a reading face, for, not for books, but it's perfect for advertising. And yet a lot of these people were, if not communists, on the left, and many of them were. And you get a rather strange debate uh, where some people felt that all that they were doing was providing the motivation for overproduction, as Marx had predicted, and in fact Chickold gave up advertising and he went back into book design. He'd always felt uncomfortable about it. But you find others, um, such as the Hungarian um, Dadaist and constructivist Lajos Kasiak, writes the most amazing articles where he says that advertising will be the future of communism because <laughs> this will be how we will sort out the distribution of goods. 
So uh, the, I think all that that tells us is that many of them were rather naive politically. <laughs> but certainly alongside a lot of the literature on graphic design, there was the development of a parallel literature which overlapped with it on advertising itself. There's a series of German magazines and Germany was to some extent, after the US, the center of innovation in pictorial advertising in the 20s and 30s. Also illuminated advertising, which was largely pioneered in Germany. There was a lot of discussion about, you know, these posters, the new typography need not only be visible during the day, it can be out there 24 hours a day, at night as well. So many people saw this as a new technological future where you could be bombarded with urgent messages all the time. But to some people, this was, as I say, merely a tool of capitalism. Whereas for others, it was the bright new future of a 24-hour dynamic world where we're getting information all the time. So you're quite right, there, is, there are anomalies. And it did harden into a style. But the debate was, from within the, the theory at least, was about whether it was a truly radical movement or whether it was merely uh, something to help perpetuate capitalism. Yeah. And I've not resolved that. I mean, I, I think, I'm, well, it's not for me to resolve it, but uh, it, the fact that they didn't and it, it divided them. Okay, um, I will have a question if nobody else wants to. Um, um, so we've uh, heard uh, a lot about Central Europe and, um, and a lot of those figures went to the United States and I'm not sure if uh, the same principles were as um, popularly employed in, in, in America as in Europe, if it had the same, I am not well read in um, history of typography, but um, it was the same type of um, popularity. Um, but uh, maybe to engage the other guests as well. Um, I know that here in Central Europe, a lot of those principles that you were talking about are, are very popular in graphic design today, or I, at least I, I feel so. Um, and I was surprised when you showed those two posters of, of the, expression, the two that were contrasting the expressionist and the, um, and the uh, modern one, let's say, um, that your students, uh, were drawn to the expressionist one, and so I just wanted to know, like today, um, is 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 there also a coming back to these principles as is here, or and how does it look like maybe you know in the United States and in other maybe places like, and then the other guests could tell us like about you know Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, maybe other other places as well. So. Um, <laughs> I think it, um, to some extent, uh, the reason that people rather like the expressionist material in, in the US is that there was, for most of the 1950s to the 70s, there was the introduction of a, a rather slick type of new typography, Swiss style and such like. Um, so a lot of American students rather like the crazy, ridiculous aspect of um, expressionism. I mean, I, I'm prejudiced because I'm actually with Siegfried Krakauer on this point where his argument is summed up in the title of his most famous book, From Caligari to Hitler, <laughs> that the, it was a collective suspension of rational thought, but um, it is fun, it's exciting, and it's easier to engage with the expressionist material. To go back to your earlier point though, it's interesting, the new typography made no impact in the English speaking world at the time. American and British graphic design was on completely different um, rails or 
a completely different direction. But they embraced it after the Second World War. And some of that had to do with people like Sutnar, who didn't only move to America, he reinvented himself as, um, and he became a major figure in American design, particularly for information design, using many of these principles. But he also theorized that he produced books on how to do this type of work. And there was a lot of European emigres, but very few of the Germans went to America. Two, Maltzan went briefly and then he returned to Germany before the war. He didn't. And although they did not, they couldn't work under the Nazis, they didn't leave Germany. A lot of them went quiet, but then they reappeared. Some went to the Soviet Union, the Lestikovs. Then they came back to Frankfurt in 1945 and reinvented that. But, but I should hand it over to my colleagues here. I'll, I'll just, I'll repeat maybe. <laughs> um, I just, I was interested in how today I feel like here in the Czech Republic we have still, I don't know if it's still or we came back to it, or, or come back to the principles of, of that we have seen in the, in the presentation, like um, asymm asymmetry, and is, is that um, coming back to it, or is, is it continuously um, a popular, all these principles are popular uh, throughout history, up, to, up until now? I, I see influence of new typography uh, in contemporary Czech design and uh, by the way also in email uh, communication between designers because they use lowercase typography. They maybe because it's fast, the communication is fast, but also in contemporary books they are coming back to new typography, and um, we uh, did uh, research uh, several years ago, 2015, on the Necrosman, and uh, we, the book was designed by Robert V. Novak, who also used new typography for, for the book design. Uh, coming back to the spirit of of this movement. Okay. Maybe also Radim Peško, mm -hmm. Adam Macháček, those are very fond of new typography and they design new typefaces, uh, but they are inspired or using these lowercase types, typefaces. Alphabets. If. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I was thinking about the uh, question, and for me, uh, like, if if you if you wander around Brno, maybe around your hometown, you you just like see the ninety six percent of like all the stuff that's made, and I think it doesn't uh, employ any of the principles, or really, like, uh, it's, um, like it was made by some mindless uh, person or something. And then there's the, the best 4% uh, or maybe more, I think, I, I hope that's more than 4% or um, then that uh, people um, study uh, these old uh, masters and uh, just like try to sometimes uh, uh, replicate these uh, techniques and also to um, to add uh, using new technologies or uh, maybe uh, you can mm, uh, you, you can borrow this uh, 3d scanning machine and and just like um, maybe there's a venue and you can scan it and just 
put it on your poster. It's, it's I think it's the same uh, when uh, first came the photography and you had this really new media and you just like you were uh, crazy about it and you just waited uh, till the two tools or um, like nowadays I I personally uh, dig uh, into uh, machine learning and uh, I'm waiting every day uh, trying to. Uh, uh, come, come with uh, the new uh, b beta softwares that can uh, that can mm, allow me to use uh, these new technologies for a poster. Like uh, you can train this uh, uh, this neural network that can produce or generate a poster. Or uh, it's it's really uh, the the possibilities today are uh, so endless that you have to limit yourself and go like a back, you, you can write your own manifesto and say, tell yourself, I will use just ma lowercase letters or maybe just one color. That's Do you think the new technology that y any designer now can do any of these effects very easily, whereas in the 1920s it was actually still quite difficult to set type that way, but now that a designer can put the type anywhere and very easily change the the font, the point size, the color, um, do you think that has eroded the design or weakened the design? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in a certain way, I think so. Uh, you have this uh, this uh, graphic uh, set of programs that you use every day. You all already know, and uh, in a way, you're also the the possibilities are endless, and also in a weird way, they you just like. Uh, when they they were using letterpress, you just you, you just couldn't like uh, flip the f font like with one click, and now you can. And uh, sometimes it's a uh, it's ba it's a bad thing for your practice. So you have to limit yourself, or maybe I don't, I don't know. Like uh, digital typography or digital technology. Uh, gives uh, unlimited uh, ways of modifying uh, contemporary typefaces. And uh, I, I see a parallel uh, with the past when new typography was spread around the world through magazines. Also today, uh, there are uh, di digital or um, Web websites, uh, foundries, uh, through which you can obtain um, new type uh, typefaces which you like. And there is a very innovative designer in Britain, Jonathan Barnbrook. Uh, his uh, foundry is called Virus. And uh, of course, you should have to uh, buy uh, new new typefaces from him, but he says that people like them so much that they steal them, they copy them, and um, he has very radical uh, radical uh, typefaces uh, which are used by metal groups, and, and these designers working for metal groups, they are stealing his typefaces, so today uh, internet and uh, this virtual space uh, as uh, as Matt Laf Laflin said um, global global village uh, gives unlimited uh, inspiration to graphic designers it's interesting that one of the things in Britain and in America one of the things which broke or ended the uh, taste for Swiss design and Helvetica <laughs> was um, punk graphics. 
and graphics that were related to pop music. And now the professor of typography in the Royal College of Art in London is a man called Neville Brodie, who used to uh, design covers and posters for the Buzzcocks and lots of bands. And, and in America, it was also a number. David and David Carson in America. So they came from a, a kind of anti um, new typography or Swiss style background because they wanted a, they wanted letter forms and layout and colors that were much more vibrant and unconventional and it had a huge impact because all these people are now major figures 30 40 years ago they were just teenagers mucking about but um well as i say neville brodie's now professor of typography <laughs> and it, but it did have a it did have a revolutionary effect on popular taste in Britain at least and in America. I don't know the extent to which that was true here because this was very much in the late 70s. But that is generally felt to be when Swiss style, which derived from Chichold and, and, and Max Bill and various others, that's when it lost its um, appeal to people under 30 at least because it had, well, as Matthew had mentioned earlier, it had become associated with corporate advertising and corporate um, publications. And the new style was countercultural, And therefore, that, that I think is, might reflect the, what another change. So what was radical in 1925 was actually corporate, dull, and establishment in 1975. I wouldn't want to draw any larger conclusions. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's getting uh, very late. We have to actually, uh, but I just, yeah, I apologize. It's just, uh, we, we do have to end here, 